Alright. Great, so you should have a handout and uh, see uh, if I get through the handout. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, the Ohio State University and the Ohio State University at Marion for uh, not just uh, giving me a job, but uh, giving me a home over the last uh, 10 years. It's really been uh, a pleasure to be here. So uh, thank you very much, and thanks for your nice comments. All right, so about a year and a half ago, I published a book called Replacing Truth. And in that book, I uh, carried out the following project. I tried to make sense of the uh, liar paradox, uh, which is a about 2,300 year old paradox associated with truth, and, uh, and uh, a bunch of other terrible paradoxes that we've discovered since then. And uh, I, the view that I developed is that these paradoxes are symptoms of an underlying defect in the concept itself. So it's not that we're making some trivial mistake or uh, some kind of problem in our reasoning or some faulty assumption is that the concept of truth itself is to blame for these paradoxes that we've uh, found ourselves in for a very long time now. So the, uh, the second half of the project is to replace the concept of truth. Say this is a defective concept and there are certain jobs that it's not very good for and replace it with a team of concepts, a pair of concepts that together can do its job without giving us any of the paradoxes, without giving us these problems. So the, uh, the job that I really focus on is uh, explaining the meanings or contents of natural language sentences uh, by way of natural language semantics. And that's a very popular form that attributes truth conditions to sentences of natural languages. Now the, uh, the paradoxes that truth generates means that it can't do that job very well at all. Anytime you try to use truth to give a semantics for a natural language like English, or really any expressively rich language at all, you end up contradicting yourself. You end up uh, saying things that are inconsistent. And it's the paradoxes that uh, force this upon you. All right, so uh, the replacement concepts, which I call ascending truth and descending truth, can do this job perfectly. And the resulting theory agrees with truth conditional semantics as a special case everywhere. Uh, the latter provides coherent results. So it's a lot like uh, anytime you have an advance in uh, science, you want the, uh, the successor theory to uh, do uh, everything that the earlier theory did uh, and uh, solve some extra problems as well. I call my method uh, conceptual engineering. And I take conceptual engineering to be actively changing some aspect of our concepts, eliminating bad ones, adding new ones, deciding which ones we should use, which words should express them. And although you can see plenty of instances of conceptual engineering in the history of philosophy, I borrowed the term from Simon Blackburn in his uh, little introductory book called Think. Um, so the idea of conceptual engineering is really taking an active role with respect to our conceptual scheme and changing it when one finds defects uh, in those concepts, and I uh, argued at length that the, the concept of truth does have this kind of defect and is ripe for uh, replacement. Now, today I'm not going to talk about that project, and instead what I'm going to do is talk about uh, something that uh, I've come to believe as a result of engaging in that project, so uh, a, a bigger picture uh, today. So I've come to think that conceptual engineering can and should play a much larger role in philosophical theorizing. Indeed, I've come to think that most, if not all, commonly discussed philosophical concepts are inconsistent. Uh, some in the way that truth is inconsistent, others in more subtle ways, uh, some based on the way they interact with one another, others just by themselves. As such, I've come to think that philosophy is, for the most part, the study of what have turned out to be inconsistent concepts. <laughs> philosophical concepts have constitutive principles, principles that constitute that concept, they tell you which concept it is, and often those constitutive principles are inconsistent with one another or with obvious facts about the world. And the concepts that I think are inconsistent include uh, the laundry list here, truth, knowledge, nature, meaning, virtue, explanation, essence, causation, validity, rationality, freedom, necessity, 
person, beauty, belief, goodness, space, time, justice, and the list goes on. <laughs> so when I say I think that philosophy is, for the most part, the study of inconsistent concepts, that's really what I mean. I think those are all inconsistent <laughs> concepts. Those are all defective concepts. All right. So I want to say a little bit about the role that I think conceptual engineering uh, should play in philosophical methodology. And uh, in order to do that, I want to kind of paint a picture of what I think philosophy is like, a account of the nature of uh, philosophy. So uh, one way to do this is to appeal to uh, some folks from the history of philosophy, namely Socrates, Nietzsche, and Wittgenstein. So from Socrates, and by Socrates here, I mean the early Platonic Socrates, the one from the early Pla uh, Dialogues of Plato, uh, we get the idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. And by this, I take it, he means the life bereft of critical thinking. So uh, subjecting one's beliefs to critical scrutiny, I take it as the crucial aspect of critical thinking. So if your life is uh, uh, without critical thinking, then it's not worth living. Critical thinking is an essential aspect of living the good life, behaving in the right way. Nietzsche, uh, the idea from him is that in the absence of any divine or objective standards for human life, we ought to craft our own. That is, you ought to take an active attitude toward your own life, toward the structure and creation of the structure of one's own life. And from Wittgenstein, I take the idea that philosophical problems are manifestations of being trapped by our language. And philosophy should take the form of therapy that ultimately dissolves the philosophical problems. And the key claim here is that the aim of philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Right? This is a nice metaphor that Wittgenstein used. And I'm going to take that metaphor pretty seriously today. So conceptual engineering is taking a Socratic, that is critical, and Nietzschean, that is active, attitude toward one's own conceptual scheme. Now, many of us think that we should already take this attitude toward our beliefs, our system of beliefs. So, for example, we should subscribe to, subject our beliefs to a battery of objections, see how well that we can reply to those objections. If a belief doesn't fare well in this process, then that's a good indicator that it should be changed. And by doing this, by considering, uh, uh, by subjecting one's beliefs to critical scrutiny, one can craft and sculpt and mold a system of beliefs for yourself, rather than just doing what most other people do, which is borrowing a set of beliefs from whoever raised you and living throughout your whole life uh, with them without really thinking about them very much. Uh, it turns out that the beliefs you borrow from your ancestors might work pretty well for today, but there's also going to be lots of cases where they don't work very well. I think we should take the same attitude toward our concepts. So the central idea of conceptual engineering is that one ought to take the same critical attitude toward one's concepts. Likewise, if a concept doesn't fare well under critical scrutiny, the active attitude kicks in, and one crafts new concepts that do the work one wants without giving rise to the problems inherent in the old ones. By doing this, one can sculpt and craft a conceptual repertoire of one's own, rather than just living one's life with the concepts borrowed from one's ancestors. So due to concepts, what most of us already think we should be doing to our beliefs. Uh, nice uh, quote from um, uh, Alexis Burgess and uh, David Plunkett in their paper, Conceptual Ethics. Our conceptual repertoire determines not only what we can think and say, but also, as a result, what we can do and who we can be. So I see conceptual engineering as being in the process or in the service of an overarching therapeutic program in, the, in the, the spirit of Wittgenstein. However, Wittgenstein's infamous conservatism, that we should leave, the philosophy should leave everything as it is, has no part in this project at all. I think some things are not fine as they are. Our beliefs are not fine. Our concepts are not fine. But we can make them better. And a radical therapeutic program does share Wittgenstein's methodology uh, as the goal showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle. So how can conceptual engineering help with this? Consider the thesis that philosophy is the study of what turned out to be inconsistent concepts. Put this idea into a Wittgensteinian program, and you get the following picture. Philosophers are arguing about how best to make sense of concepts that are actually inconsistent. Right? Trying to figure out how to analyze concepts that are actually defective. The arguments 
consist, that is the arguments that typically in philosophy, consist in privileging certain constitutive principles here and others there, but ultimately the debates rarely make discernible progress because the concepts being analyzed uh, and the concepts used to conduct the debate are defective. That's one reason that philosophers end up dealing with so many paradoxes and conceptual puzzles. It seems like that's our whole job, is dealing with paradoxes and conceptual puzzles. Right? That's the fly model. That's where you are and where I am. Yeah. Now, how do we escape? <clears throat> For the past 400 years, philosophy has been shrinking. That's a sociological fact. Physics, geology, chemistry, economics, biology, anthropology, sociology, meteorology, psychology, linguistics, computer science, cognitive science, those subject matters were all part of philosophy in 1600, a mere 400 years ago. And we're talking about a discipline that has a 2600 year uh, history. 400 years in 2600 years is nothing. As scientific revolution ground on, more and more sciences were born. And this process is essentially philosophy outsourcing its subject matter as something new as sciences. The process is rather complicated, but the most important part of it is getting straight on the right concepts to use, and that subject matter then gets brought under scientific methodology. Ultimately, the, what I'm calling the radical therapeutic program, showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle, is taking an active role in this outsourcing process, pushing it faster and faster. You identify conceptual defects, that's the Socratic idea. You craft new concepts to avoid the old defects. That's the Nietzschean idea, with an eye toward preparing the philosophical subject matter for outsourcing as a science. The ultimate goal of the process is the potential end of philosophy. Escape for the fly. The end of philosophy is merely potential because it's likely that our new technologies will give us the new inconsistent concepts that are philosophically significant, and these will need to get sorted out as well. So it's not obvious that our stock of defective concepts is ever going to uh, effectively decrease. It really depends on how much conceptual engineering occurs. Speeding it up is really up to us, philosophers. The speed with which we get new defective concepts is mostly not up to us. People just make them up as they're needed or wanted. Nevertheless, you can envision a world where we succeeded in making philosophy evaporate. But sometime after that, it shows up again with new philosophically significant defective concepts. And after that, philosophy might break out during especially rapid technological or social growth. Kind of like acne. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the idea. What I've called a radical therapeutic program, a kind of call for a way of doing away with philosophy. Now, the scientific element in this radical therapeutic program I call metrological naturalism, and it's separable from the conceptual engineering element. However, the two go together well. Metrological naturalism is more successful with consistent concepts, and in order to do conceptual engineering well, we need to know what kinds of replacement concepts to aim for. One might even say that metrological naturalism without conceptual engineering is empty, and conceptual engineering without metrological naturalism is blind. Contrast this radical therapeutic program that I've just outlined for you with the um, most prominent methodology in contemporary philosophy, the Canberra Plan, which owes much to David Lewis. According to Lewis's methodology, one begins by assembling the platitudes for a philosophical term, and then you try to figure out what real, relatively fundamental thing they might describe. If the platitudes are inconsistent, well, you just try to make a weighted majority of them true, try to come figure out what comes best to uh, satisfying them, and then that's what the philosophical term designates. That's it, right? Once you've done that, you know, it's mother time, you're done. So the methodology is static, it has nothing to do with change or improvement, and indeed, David Lewis writes, quote, one comes to philosophy already endowed with a stock of opinions. It is not the business of philosophy either to undermine or to justify these pre-existing opinions to any great extent but only to try to discover ways of expanding them into an orderly system. I think it's hard to be more wrong than that. <laughs> so, there are several conceptual engineering projects already in philosophy, and I want to lay out two of them. One is an amelioration project, so named by Sally Haslinger. She uh, uh, says that uh, we need to change various key terms, especially terms associated with gender and race, for social justice reasons. For example, 
Woman, the word woman, is currently ex uh, expresses a concept like adult human female. But Hassinger argues that woman is used primarily to subordinate people based on their stereotypical female characteristics. So she suggests that uh, the word woman should instead be used to express something like the concept, a person subordinated based on stereotypical female characteristics. Change the meaning of the word woman. And by doing that, the goal is to fight that subordination by making it explicit right, in the concept expressed by woman. Rather than having it be kind of underground, having it be something implicit, you make the subordination explicit so that it is something that is right there in front of your face when you're doing it, and you can uh, then, uh, if you're using the word woman in this new way, you can have as your goal the elimination of women, the elimination of people who are subordinated by uh, uh, appeal to their stereotypical female characteristics. All right. so, so that is obviously a conceptual engineering project, and it's a project that um, I think uh, you can see uh, major uh, similarities uh, in uh, similarities uh, between her project and mine. Another one. There's conceptual engineering projects in contemporary metaphysics. So, for example, the development of grounding and fundamentality to replace modal notions in Ted Sider's concept of structure as a generalization of Lewis's naturalness. But one particular concerns the idea that some or all metaphysical disputes are pointless. So metaphysics has come under a number of criticisms lately, and one of those major criticisms is that anytime you're engaged in an argument about, say, how many things there are, right, is there one thing or are there multiple things because you're counting its parts also, um, then uh, really the two people engaged in that dispute are actually just talking past one another. Right? The dispute is a merely verbal dispute, not worth engaging in. Now, uh, probably, uh, sorry, those who advocate this position called metaphysical deflationists have some sophisticated tools with which to formally defend this criticism. And probably the most well-known is called quantifier variance. There's multiple equally good interpretations of what people mean by the existential quantifier there is involved in formulating these metaphysical questions. So those engaged in the ontological disputes, the metaphysicians, uh, uh, are simply talking past one another according to this criticism. Now the metaphysicians have strong objections to this criticism, uh, but they also have proposed a new kind of strategy for conducting metaphysical disputes just in case the deflationists turn out to be right. And the strategy, which is called Plan B by Ted Sider, uh, <laughs> who's one of his primary advocates, is to give up using natural languages like English for doing ontology, for doing metaphysics, and instead stipulate a fundamental meaning for existential quantifiers in a new language, often called ontologies, <laughs> and conduct the ontological disputes using this new language and its new uh, stipulated to be fundamental uh, existential quantifier. That's obviously a conceptual engineering project, right? Obviously a conceptual engineering project. This one is less a, uh, wow, our concept is defective, so let's change it and uh, make it better, and it's more of a, uh, damn, uh, we're getting all this flack. Maybe we should start talking in a new way and change our, uh, our concepts so that we can avoid this criticism. Um, but still, a conceptual engineering project. <clears throat> Metrological naturalism. So I said there's two aspects to this radical therapeutic program. There's conceptual engineering and metrological naturalism. So let me talk a little bit about metrological naturalism. It's that the, in the dimension, so metrological naturalism is a kind of methodological naturalism, which is a not very popular philosophical methodology these days. There are several folks out there who are engaged in this, but not a whole lot. Uh, methodological naturalism is the following. In the dimension of describing and explaining the world, science is the measure of all things. Scientific methods are the only reliable route to true, true beliefs, but scientific results are fallible. Philosophy should be continuous with the sciences in two senses. One, science does not require justification or grounding from philosophy. Philosophers have typically, for a very long time now, well, since there's been science, taken it as our job to say, you guys are doing okay, right? <coughs> Scientists, you guys are doing just fine, right? Um, that you need some, some kind of uh, uh, justification from first principles. And methodological naturalism rejects that. And two, science and philosophy should pursue similar goals and employ similar methods. Now here's some problems for methodological naturalism. It seems like many of the things that a naturalist says are not scientific. For example, no science concludes that science is the only road to truth, right? That's not a scientific conclusion. 
<laughs> Two, there are no cons there's no consensus about de what demarcates science from non-science. This is one of the, like, it's kind of like a, a standard example of a problem in philosophy that has no solution to it. How do you demarcate science from non-science? And, and there's been like hundreds of people working on this problem and still no real consensus on how to do it. Uh, also, there's no consensus on the nature of scientific methodology, right? Obviously, there's observation, hypothesis, prediction, and experiment, but beyond those kinds of banalities, there's, it's hard to say uh, exactly what the scientific method consists in, and there's lots of disputes about this. It's also not exactly obvious that someone who's working at the, uh, the LHC, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, who's a particle physicist, is doing the same kind of methodology as, say, a sociologist, or as a, a biologist who's working on marine mammals or something like that. Many philosophical topics are abstract and resist scientific methods, and also scientific methods aim for descriptive results, but lots of philosophical topics are normative. Now, the version of this view that I want to advocate is called metrological naturalism because the uh, Greek word for measure is metron, and metrological the uh, theoretic uh, methodological naturalism would be called metrological naturalism. All right. The big idea from the scientific revolution is that we can use mathematics to explain, predict, and control the world around us. That's the big idea that uh, comes out in Galileo's very nice uh, formulation that uh, mathematics is the language of nature. So uh, it's really uh, been, um, uh, you know, since the early 1600s that we've had this uh, idea but it wasn't really until the 1800s, and in fact the late 1800s, that theorists turned their attention toward providing a scientific understanding of how mathematics is applied in this way. And the result of these investigations is called measurement theory, how mathematics applies to the natural world in the sciences. And you can think of measurement theory as an all-purpose foundation for scientific theorizing in much the same way that set theory can be thought of as an all-purpose foundation for mathematics. Metrological naturalism is the methodological principles that philosophers should use measurement theory as a guide or model in philosophical theorism. All right, so you should, uh, according to this methodology, we should be using the resources of the sciences in philosophical theorizing. There's lots of ways that you can do this. Let me just briefly say uh, three of them. One, cast your philosophical theories of X, or X is whatever uh, philosophical concept you want to be thinking about, as measurement systems, and uh, there's an entire literature on how to uh, construct measurement systems. Uh, we know pretty well how to do this for things like length uh, and weight, uh, but uh, trying to figure out how to do a measurement system for, say, truth or justice is a lot more complicated and involves uh, a lot more, um, uh, a, 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 I mean, it involves a lot of difficulties here, and at this point this is um, something of an analogy, but I hope to be able to um, turn this into uh, more of a, uh, a sort of straightforward project in the near future. Two, focus on semantic theories of philosophical locutions rather than trying to analyze philosophical concepts. Right? Philosophers still, since the uh, early uh, 20th century, and, you know, the whole 20th century and still into the 21st century, we have philosophers who are trying to analyze concepts. We just had uh, four uh, job talks in the philosophy department, and several of them were uh, philosophical analysis projects where they're trying, so a person is trying to put forward a philosophical analysis of a concept. I think the last one was on um, authoritative, uh, uh, authoritative obligation, right? What's an analysis of that? Um, and nobody like blinks an eye or says anything about that, right? I mean, it's not like that person got a, a hand saying, isn't that totally bankrupt? Right? Um, that, that didn't happen. Right? That's because phil philosophical or conceptual analysis is still an extremely popular method in philosophy. I think that instead of doing a philosophical analysis or a conceptual analysis, we should be focused on semantics for philosophical terms, because doing the semantics for philosophical terms can often cut through uh, uh, a lot of um, unnecessary uh, uh, assumptions that I think cause a lot of problems in debates. One example here would be uh, Reasons, which is a uh, project that I'm engaged in with uh, Brian Weaver right now. So getting straight on the semantics for Reasons locutions can help tremendously in assessing traditional philosophical debates about Reasons. For example, example, the debate between factualists who say that Reasons are facts and mentalists who say Reasons are mental states. Right? 
Um, the, the semantics actually, I think, uh, exposes that debate as uh, not very substantive. And three, utilize the tools of measurement theory for answering philosophical questions. Uh, I want to skip through the uh, rest of the bit on uh, methodol or methodological naturalism and get down to the ending so that there's some time for Q&A. So far, I've uh, laid out a radical therapeutic uh, vision of what philosophy is all about. I've talked about conceptual engineering as one aspect of a proper philosophical methodology. We should take an active role toward uh, uh, altering and improving our conceptual scheme. It's really the big idea there. And I've also advocated a scientific element toward, uh, or a scientific element in this philosophical methodology that I've called metrological naturalism. And I've, laid a lot, I've talked a little bit about uh, the aspects of each, uh, uh, of each of those two parts. Now I want to finish by uh, uh, offering a, uh, a note of caution and say, this isn't, you know, don't think of conceptual engineering as a sort of anything goes kind of uh, project. Actually, one of the big uh, things that I think needs to be explored is the extent to which there are important constraints on conceptual engineering, how we can justify changes in uh, our conceptual scheme. So consider the following. Here, I'm not speaking in my own voice, I'm speaking in the voice of somebody that you should imagine making this argument, and then we'll think about this argument, whether it's any good. So it's been set. <clears throat> the pro-choice position and the anti-infanticide position are the right ones to have with respect to abortion and infanticide. Assume that these are my practical commitments. Furthermore, when I reflect on the nature of time, I find myself committed to the idea that I do not have temporal parts. That is, I don't have parts that are uh, 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 separated in time, where I have one part of me right now, and then another part of me in a moment, and then another part of me a few minutes later. Instead, I'm wholly present metaphysically at every moment. Right? That view is called endurantism. It's a view on the nature of time and the nature of change and persistence. And so that means I'm an endurantist, and presumably I'm an endurantist about a zygote infant, which is the thing that's wholly present throughout the change from having no rights as a zygote to having rights as an infant. Remember my initial position here. So far, so good. But now I start thinking about metaethics, and I start thinking about theories of justice, and I arrive at the plausible view that rights are properties had by objects, and that judicial locutions denote these properties. So I'm going to reject some kind of anti-realism about uh, uh, justice uh, locutions, things like rights. Okay, so I'm going to be a realist about rights locutions. And now that I think about it a bit more, I find it difficult to believe that having rights is not an intrinsic property of some entity. So now I've got a problem. How can a single thing be intrinsically killable at one time as a zygote and then not intrinsically killable later on as an infant? Now I need to think hard about which concepts of time, persistence, and justice I should use given my commitments to a pro-choice anti-infanticide position. Is this a good reason to revise my concepts of time, concepts of rights, and concepts of uh, persistence or uh, associated concepts of justice? I'm not attributing this project to Hasslinger or to anybody else, so I'm just trying to think through the kinds of conditions that one might want on an acceptable conceptual engineering project. So here's one way to think about it. I surely have a reason to change my concepts in this way, but it's the wrong kind of reason. And there's a the large philosophical uh, literature on the wrong kinds of reasons, and I think that uh, it might be applicable here. Here's how. My reason for changing what concept I express by one of these terms is not a reason to think that the new concept is a good one. Right? Instead, it's just a reason to change the concept. It's not a reason to think that the new one is uh, valuable or, uh, or the right one uh, for the job. All right. So um, as such, I'm somewhat uneasy about the, like more than somewhat uneasy, about the conceptual engineering project that might be inspired by the instep uh, argument there. All right. So I d I'm not going to say more about the, uh, about the example. Uh, I do think that conceptual Engineering requires uh, a lot of thought to uh, decide on which kinds of conceptual engineering projects are legitimate and should be pursued, and which kinds of conceptual engineering projects are wrongheaded and should be uh, uh, ignored or uh, what have you. 
So uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it. Thanks so much. Uh, I don't have anything to say about philosophy because I'm just a scientist. Fair enough. But I do have something to say about what you said about science. I Good. think you may be overstated Good. what science can do. Because the science, uh, when we make these mathematical models, they are models. They are not the reality of the world. The model is different from the reality. And one thing that scientists, I think, including the sociologist you pointed out to, would agree to is if our model is inconsistent with evidence, whatever that evidence might be, we would have to revise the model to make it more consistent of with the evidence. So I'm not, you, you seem, when you were talking about science, to give it a bit more, um, how should I put it, solidity in some sense than that. Because we're always willing to go back and revise our uh, ideas about anything. Gravitation, for example, you know about 1915 and how that view changed, oh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, Absolutely. I, if I gave you that impression, then that was a mistake, because I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that you said. So I, I don't disagree with anything that you said. That's a first, I think. <laughs> but no, I agree 100% with what you said, and the, the, the goal then would be to get uh, uh, you know, continue this sort of what I call the outsourcing process where, you know, uh, uh, subject matters that uh, are now considered to be part of philosophy will in the future uh, be outsourced as sciences, just as we've seen this process happening over the last 400 years with, you know, every single different scientific discipline you can imagine used to be a part of philosophy, it used to be part of natural philosophy. And uh, so all I'm saying is, try to get our defective philosophical concepts in shape so that they can be outsourced uh, as sciences. And then, sci then we, you know, philosophers, we're, then we're done with those, right? Now it's, now it's up to the sciences to, to figure out uh, uh, how to make sense of them. And then you run the, 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 the whole gamut of uh, scientific methodology and you change your models based on evidence and the whole, the whole deal. But then, uh, then it's just gonna be scientific methodology. Okay. Uh, have you proposed a very fissile mixture yet? How can you be sure that your conceptual engineering isn't going to find awful defects in the concepts that are deployed in your methodological <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, self-referential criticism. Nice. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, I, I can't be sure that that's, uh, uh, that that wouldn't happen, and in fact, it seems probably pretty likely, given that uh, metrological naturalism is uh, appealing to the very concepts that I have already said are almost certainly inconsistent. So um, there's an important, uh, an important thing to remember about our concepts, even though they are inconsistent, at least many of them, uh, they're still often useful in lots of cases. For example, um, I mean, the example that I use uh, throughout the book as an analogy is the concept of mass as it occurs in classical you know, Newtonian mechanics. And um, mass, I think, is an inconsistent concept, uh, but it's still uh, extraordinarily useful. We use it for all kinds of things, uh, you know, from building houses to uh, putting robots on comets. And um, uh, think about how insane it would be to use general relativity to, say, build a bridge. Right? That would be, it would be really uh, uh, extremely unwieldy. It would take you uh, far longer, and you would end up with the same bridge that you, uh, that you designed using uh, Newtonian mechanics, right? Uh, assuming you didn't make some mistake with the, the relativity. So uh, I agree with you 100% that it's, it's likely that the concepts involved in my own methodology are themselves defective, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful for this purpose. Uh, the defect when you, when you go to replace the concept, you try to figure out whether the defect in that concept actually impedes its utility. And if it does, that's when you want to replace it. So if I were to be shown conclusively that the, one of the concepts involved in my own methodology had a defect and that defect was impeding its utility in my methodology, then I would be more than happy to replace it. Um, so when you talk about concepts being inconsistent, is that supposed to mean something like uh, we start reasoning by employing these concepts and we list things we take to be true about them and then somehow we arrive at a, a contradiction? 
It's a bit by consistency. Yeah, it's a bit more than that. So it's not just things you take to be true about the concept. Rather, it's principles that you take to be constitutive of the concept. And I think it's very important to, to get straight on uh, what constitutive principles are. As I'm sure you know, that there are lots of philosophers who are skeptical of the whole idea of constitutive principles for our concepts. And uh, we, I guess, Western uh, you know, analytic philosophers have been engaged in a big fight about this over the last you know, 70 years. And um, uh, so uh, one of the things that I take very seriously is the project of saying exactly what a constitutive principle is. And this, when you identify the constitutive principles for your concepts and then recognize that they're inconsistent either in themselves or with established uh, uh, you know, claims about the world or with other constitutive principles for other concepts, that's when you've got the inconsistency. And so it seems like you're going to run into a problem of holism where you have to deploy other concepts yes. to arrive at the contradiction of yes. the inconsistency. Yes. So, so where do you pin the blame? Concept to engineer. Yeah, yeah, where do you pin the blame? Uh, I think that uh, what you should do in those kinds of cases, and you find these kinds of cases even in the, the truth literature, right? So um, for people who are engaged in discussion of the paradoxes, there's those, there are those of us who think that um, we should blame truth, right? And then there are those of us who think we should blame logic, right? It's that our logic is, uh, is the problem. And so when you reason yourself to a contradiction in the liar paradox, it's the logic that's at fault, not the concept of truth. So um, there's a, there is already this trade-off that you're, uh, or, or, or this kind of conundrum that, that you described in the early project, in replacing truth. How do you decide? Well, I think that the, um, there are uh, ways of deciding, and for the most part, I use uh, something like uh, pragmatic cost-benefit analysis to do that. What's the cost of changing our entire logic for our entire natural language versus the cost of changing our concept of truth? Right, the cost of changing the logic is dramatically higher. The cost of changing the concept of truth is much lower. So it makes better sense to pin the blame on the concept of truth. I think there are more, um, I mean, I think that's, that's a, a short answer to the question. I think there are more subtle answers that don't appeal to cost-benefit trade-offs, but um, they're tricky. And then you can always come back and say, well, you know the concepts involved in those reasonings aren't effective. Guilty as charged. I mean, we, we're swimming in a sea of inconsistent concepts, and you just kind of keep your head above water as best you can. Two more. We got one way in the back. Okay. Oh, I, I guess my my question was similar to Neil's, uh, except it, it didn't appeal to like the metrological yeah. met, uh, approach. It's just the the injunction that we have to kind of take an active role in revising our concept. I mean, yeah. Surely, yeah. Uh, one of the uh, confused notions is that of agency and action. Yeah, and so surely. I don't even understand how we're supposed to, uh, 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 what, what exactly you're demanding of us, right? If, if the very notion of agency is, you know, uh, uh, hopelessly confused. Good. Um, just in a nutshell, figure out its job, figure out the, the defects, and figure out whether the defects impede that job, it, it performing that job. And if it does, then that's right for replacement. And then the big question is, what do you replace it with? And there, uh, you try out a whole bunch of stuff and see what works and what doesn't work, really. Um, or you make stuff up and you get lucky, who knows. Um, but there, I don't think that there's some sort of algorithm for, uh, you know, that you can kind of plug agency or some other, you know, necessity or validity or whatever and, you know, crank out your... Uh, your, your replacements or anything like that. I think coming up with replacements is much more of an art and it takes um, a lot of, um, what, banging your head against the wall? Something like that. Let's get one more over here. So I'm trying to figure out what counts as a good concept. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a big part of your criticism, at least in the first part of the talk, is that these concepts are inconsistent. But at least one way of reading what's wrong with the inset argument at the end of it is that it's just about making your concepts consistent with your you know, pre-theoretical commitments. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is bound up with the, other, the answers you've been giving so far, but I just want to get very clear on, uh, you, you've been talking about utility, you've been talking yeah. about usefulness. Yeah. In what sense, to what purpose are the concepts supposed to be useful in order to count as a good one? Yeah, good. And, and I think that you can give different answers there. For, uh, for the case of truth, which is the one that I'm most familiar with, right, the, the conceptual engineering project that I'm most familiar with, uh, the, the answer to what's uh, the concept good for, there's really two answers. One, it has this important expressive role that allows us to say things that we couldn't otherwise say. 
and it has this important explanatory role. It allows us to explain things like content and meaning that we wouldn't otherwise be able to explain. And so there, you look at what it does for you in an explanatory uh, role and in an expressive role, at least with respect to truth, and uh, you figure out whether the, uh, the concept of truth does both of those well, it doesn't, and uh, then you figure out uh, what would, right, what team of replacements would, and then you advocate those as the replacements. Now, uh, in other cases, uh, I'm not suggesting that you're always going to get a clean, like, expressive role, explanatory role uh, distinction there, but what you can do is think hard about what that concept does, what kinds of things we use it to do, not just philosophers, but, I mean, humans, and, uh, and then see how well it does that and, and go from there. But that's really the, uh, the ultimate, I think, standard for um, for um, quality of a concept is going to be how well does it do what we want it to do. So you might be okay with an inconsistent concept if it was if it turned out to be really useful. If it turned out to be really useful and its inconsistency didn't impede that utility in any way. Yeah, no problem. I don't think that's a, I don't think that should be replaced. Then. Yeah. Well, one of the few concepts I'm certain of with this group is that the bar is very friendly. <laughs> we'll continue these conversations in a much richer way. Please congratulate.